Welcome everyone. It's great to see you all out today. I'm Cheryl Landrew, and I'm really thrilled to see such a great crowd today. Ready to introduce the, ne the next session. So I know we have a standing room only crowd, so thank you for, for your patience with us as we grow. So our next session is with Nicole Hannah-Jones, who as you know, is a superstar, and we're so thrilled she made the trip to New Orleans today. Uh, moderating her is one of our favorites, Mitch Landrew, so we're happy to have him as well. <clears throat> we're asking you to silence your cell phones and come to the book signing about 30 minutes after the session ends down in Peterson Lobby. So thank you so much, Mitch and Nicole. Man, I'm happy my wife said I was one of her favorites. I know, right? I, I like that. <laughs> thank you, honey. <laughs> the least it's, you can do. Absolutely. Uh, it's nice to be here with you. Um, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for coming. I have to say this at the outset. I'm speaking for myself today and only myself. So whatever comes out of my mouth is mine and not anybody else's that I might be working with at the current time. <laughs> but listen, um, you, let me, can I just tell you about this, this young lady for a second? Uh, and she can confirm some of this, but you, you were born and raised in Iowa. Yes. That's true? Yes. All right. You went to Notre Dame. That's true? Yes. And the University of North Carolina. That's all right, Notre Dame. He's got a Notre Dame person. <laughs> University of North Carolina, where you got your master's degree. Yes. Uh, she got this thing called a, a, a MacArthur Genius Grant, like the only smartest people in the world get that. <laughs> There's some awards, you know, like best snowball and stuff like that. But like one of the biggest is a Pulitzer. So she got a Pulitzer. A Peabody. Oh, we almost done. Let's wrap all that part up. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, she, is, she is one of the most celebrated journalists in uh, the history of our country. And um, I just have to tell you, because you're, you're from New Orleans, you're just from New Orleans. She's been here a lot of times. She loves the city. But I the do. way we start things off is where are you from and where did you go to high school at? <laughs> and then somehow, well, I really did want to ask you, how did you find yourself uh, at the University of Notre Dame? And why did you choose that school to go to? Oh, Lord. Okay. I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, first of all, hey, everyone. I do, I do truly love the city. I come here as often as possible, and one day I hope to maybe even buy a little place here. Uh, I really love the city. Um, so, yes. <laughs> and I also just have to shout out the, the Tulane Book Festival. Like, the roster of writers is amazing. I'm just gonna have to like come here for the entire festival next year. It's just, it's amazing to see all of these great uh, writers and thinkers gather together and great to see all of y'all. Okay, now to the question. Um, how I ended up in Notre Dame. So I grew up in Waterloo, Iowa. How many of y'all been there? Oh, seriously? Shout out, okay. Um, so it's it's a you know it's a small town. My I was I'm a child of the Great Migration. My family uh, is from Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, and when um, my father was two years old, that's when they start putting the young ones out to help bring water to the sharecroppers in the field. And my grandmother decided her kids were not going to pick cotton, so she got on the Illinois Central line, um, same line that took black folks to Chicago, but. We were too country and got off the train too early and didn't quite make it. So <laughs> that's how I ended up in, you know, a child of Iowa, not a child of Illinois. But I, um, I didn't grow up with a lot of folks who went to college. I, I was a, a very good student and I had no idea where I wanted to go. And I was working in the grocery store at the cash register one day and this uh, young black man came in with a Notre Dame letterman jacket on. And I was like, hmm, you go to Notre Dame? I never met anybody who went to Notre Dame. And he said, yes, his name was uh, LaShane Sadler. He played on the football team. So I went home that day. I looked up Notre Dame in our World Book Encyclopedia set. <laughs> this was definitely pre-internet. Um, and I saw Notre Dame was a six-hour drive from my house. It was close to a big city. Um, 
I looked up the black population of South Bend and saw it was about the same as my city, so it was, it was a few of us. And I just decided to apply there. It was the only school I applied to. Um, and if it weren't for seeing, hey, uh, if it weren't for seeing um, Lashane Sadler, I don't, I don't know where I was going to go, but uh, that's how I ended up there. Is that where you, had you decided before you went to Notre Dame to go into journalism or when did, how did that come to you? Yeah, I, I was leaning toward um, either journalism or being a historian, which maybe you could tell from my work. I, I found the, the, the best of both worlds. So I, um, I was, I know this would be very hard for y'all to believe, I was extremely nerdy as a child. Um, y'all supposed to laugh a little more at that. <laughs> right, you're supposed to be like, you're so fabulous now, I can't imagine. You were, I, I, was, I was very nerdy. Uh, I came from a household of avid readers, but my dad, like, he loved Louis L'Amour uh, Westerns, and my mom loved Danielle Steele novels, and I read all of those books, and we used to read um, the newspaper every day. My dad subscribed to two newspapers every day. And when I was 11 years old, I got my first letter to the editor published in uh, our local paper. It was uh, 1988. Jesse Jackson was running to become the first sure black was. president. And so this tells you how nerdy I am, because little 11-year-old Nicole was outraged at how poorly Jesse Jackson did in the Iowa primary. <laughs> Were you surprised? I wasn't surprised. I mean, there are not that many black people in Iowa. Um, are there? No. I don't think so. <laughs> Um, there aren't, but my hometown um, was 15% black, so we were blacker than the country, and there were certainly enough black folks to segregate us. Um, so to me, I thought, apparently, I don't even remember this, I just have the letter to the editor. Um, I, was, I, I just thought Jesse Jackson was a good candidate, and I believe that the, part of the reason that he didn't get any support was because he was black. So I wrote this letter and I said, one day we're gonna have a black president, whether you like it or not. And of course that ended up uh, occurring. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I just remember every day coming home, opening the newspaper uh, to the opinion section to see did they publish my letter. And one day it was in there. And I never forgot that power of like seeing my name in the newspaper and knowing that I could see something that I didn't like in the world and I could write about it. And maybe I would change your mind, maybe I wouldn't, but I would force you to have to grapple with that. So I started thinking about being a journalist uh, really at the age of 11. And when I went to Notre Dame, Notre Dame did not have a journalism program at the time. They have one now, but they didn't have one back then. So I majored in my first love, which was history, and I double majored in African American studies. And you must have had a premonition at some point along the way, or somebody grabbed you as a mentor and said, hey, listen, if you, wanna, if you want the power of the pen and you need history, especially African American history to guide you, journalism is the pathway rather than being an author? Yeah, I, I well, are there some academics in here? Oh yeah, they okay. got some. Timmy's an ap academic. Well. <laughs> I ultimately chose journalism over being a historian because I wanted people to read what I wrote. Right. right. <laughs> At Tulane University. Now, Sorry, Will. Right. Now, of course, we know that that was my thinking back then. We know a lot of people read history. And of course, a lot of historians and academics write for a common reader. But my thinking really was I didn't, I love the past, but I love the past because studying the past helped me understand the world I was living in, helped me to, you know, I, I was, um, was bused to white school starting in the second grade all the way to the 12th grade. And I just remember studying like the, through my school bus window, how everything changed when we got, when we started leaving the black side of town, like the literal landscape of segregation, you could see it right through the window. You could see once we crossed the river to the white side of town, the roads were more, you know, they were paved and taken care of. They had all the restaurants over there. They had all the shopping facilities. And I had questions and, and history was answering those questions, but I didn't want to just look backwards. And as a journalist, you're able, of course, to uh, try to change the society you live in by writing about uh, what's happening right now. And so that's really why I chose journalism. Well, I I I first of all, thank you so much. And uh, I took you through that for, for a reason. Um, this is one of the most provocative thinkers and writers in the history of our country. And uh, when people want to dismiss her work. I'm gonna have him on stage with they, me from now on. They, you coming. Come on. They don't bring they, you with me. They don't, they don't necessarily understand that talking to one of the most credentialed historians 
and they dismiss you because, well, you, maybe you didn't go to the right school. Well, you know, Notre Dame is pretty good. University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill is pretty good. <laughs> Howard University, yes. which is where you alight from time to time, is pretty good. So real deal stuff. Um, but you came at some point in time. By the way, she was supposed to be interviewed by Dean Bacasio. She got stuck with me, so I apologize. But she, I, she would have asked, when, she, when you got to the New York Times and you were writing for them, what was the seat, like how did, where did the 1619 Project come from in your mind and how hard was it for you to get them to say yes and then once you did it and you know, everything hit the fan, how, how did you move from space to space to where you are now? Mm. Um, so Dean Bakay, of course, is the um, former editor of the New York Times, the first black editor of the New York Times and the editor who hired me. And when uh, Dean called me in to talk to me about coming to the Times, so I, I never uh, really aspired to the Times, frankly. Um, I just didn't, I didn't dream that high. I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a black girl from Waterloo, Iowa. My dream job was to write about black folks for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. They never hired me, but it worked out okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when, when Dean called me in, I was very clear that I, I was finally, I was at ProPublica, I was finally doing the work I worked my entire career to do, and I didn't need to be at the Times. If being at the Times meant I would have that name on my resume, but I couldn't do the work that I had spent 15 years trying to be in a position to do. I was doing long form investigative work. Um, and Dean was like, that's exactly why I wanna hire you. And I said, I don't even think I'm a New York Times type journalist, I mean, I don't, uh, present like many of the journalists there. I don't um, behave like many of the journalists there. Um, and he said, that's exactly why I want you here. And I have to say, there was never a moment under Dean's leadership where um, that he did not treat me as if that were true. Um, and um, so I had been thinking about if you read the preface to the book Origin Story, you know I've been thinking about the year 1619 since I was 15 years old, when I took this one semester black studies elective course and a teacher named Mr. Ray Dial um, introduced me to the book Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett. And I, I understood even as a 15 year old the power of that date, that one, it stood in for a lineage. Um, it was shocking to me as a black girl to learn that black people had been here before the pilgrims um, on the Mayflower. Um, but it also stood in as the power of erasure, that the, the white lion did come in 1619, we just weren't being taught about it. And so I realized that um, what we had been taught to think of as history was not really history, it was memory. And it was really like, what does our society teach us? What does our society want us to remember? What does it want us to forget? So I've thought about 1619 for a long time and I've spent really my entire career trying to excavate uh, the way that the legacy of slavery shapes our society, right? When I spent so many years writing about school segregation, well, why were we segregating black kids? It's because they were descendants of slavery. You know, why were we segregating black people in housing? It's because they're descendants of slavery, but we don't think about it that way. So when the anniversary was approaching, the 400th anniversary of the first Africans being sold into the British North American colonies, um, I was obsessing again. And this time I was obsessing, like all these years later, you know, five years or so since I was 15, um, Y'all must, y'all are journalists too. You can't do math either, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like one, two, three. Uh, <laughs> right? So, like 30 years after uh, I first came across the dates, I realized most Americans still didn't know it. 1619 was still being largely obscured. Uh, from our national narrative, but I wasn't some little girl in Waterloo, Iowa anymore. I had the biggest megaphone in the world, which is the New York Times. So I just decided to pitch this project to take over. Um, it, it's so funny because it was such a simple idea. I, I couldn't clearly have imagined what, what it would become, but I pitched this idea to just um, take over the, the issue of the magazine and dedicate each essay to looking at a modern American phenomenon tracing its surprising uh, link back to slavery. It was very simple and I didn't get any pushback, but just to be clear Until for the Until after young folks, it was published. Yes, right? Yeah, is, yeah. You have to put yourself, so I spent a lot of my career being denied, 
right? Wanting to write about black people, wanting to write about race and being told that's not good for your career, that's not how you ascend, um, you're biased um, because you want to do that. And um, so I knew that in order to be able to pitch something ambitious like the 1619 Project, I already had to have shown that you could do work like this and win the accolades that they, that are industry values so much, um, I had to put myself in a position to be undenied un and undeniable, even though you can still be denied, as I clearly was by the University of North Carolina. Um, but you have to at least do the things that you can do to put yourself in that position to not, not be denied. So let's talk about that. You, you, you danced through a couple of uh, the Great Migration. <laughs> not everybody may know as much about that as you should know. Um, and then you talk about origin stories and the importance of them, which is really the crux of and the theory and the theme that runs through um, the, the, the work that you're doing. And I'd like you just to talk about the origin story and why it's so important to get that right and how we have not gotten it right yet. Yeah, so, I, you know, I myself am conflicted about the idea of origin stories. And um, I don't think you can ever have a single origin story. And we also understand that the entire purpose of origin stories are, I think, by nature, somewhat propagandistic, right? Even in our own family, right? The origin story serves to tell you something great about who you are as a family, who you are as a people, who you are as a country. Um, but they do order how we conceive of ourselves. And I would say in America, our origin story, uh, the typical 1776 where uh, these intrepid colonists uh, dared to uh, fight the most powerful empire in the world because they wanted freedom, these unalienable rights, um, that that origin story has really been used to justify so much tyranny, right? So much inequality, all of these racial and economic hierarchies that we have. Um, and so I wanted to challenge that origin story and say, well, if you really want to understand America, um, its most vexing issues, why we had an insurrection on January 6th, how a, the same country that can elect a black president eight years later, four years later, will elect a white nationalist. Like, if you want to understand that country, He's a white nationalist, like that's, he just is. Um, that if you want to um, understand that country, you have to go back. You have to think of our origin point as not being in these ideas of freedom, but the practice of slavery. And that I just think there's something useful about um, resetting an origin story and helping a society to understand itself, even though uh, for every origin story, you could go further and further back, right? Like, what, what is the actual point of origin of anything? Um, but this is the one I wanted to use kind of as um, the way to orient our society to understand itself better. Well, one of, the, one of the pushbacks that comes is, you know, slavery was such a long time ago. Why y'all keep talking about it? That's my favorite one. Don't you like that? <laughs> um, or, you know, the consequences of slavery don't exist today or it was 150 years ago. You mentioned Reverend Jackson. I was in Selma on Sunday with the president. Reverend Jackson was there. Um, and on my way back, I went to Montgomery where, as you know, Brian Stevenson has Peace and Justice Museum, which um, memorializes lynching in America that you know was as late as 1950. Um, and so you talk a little bit in your book um, in, in the last chapter about um, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and that pivotal moment when we seemed to be heading in the wrong direction and then something happened and then the country woke up for a minute and then we keep flipping back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And I'd like you to maybe just kind of talk a little bit about wh why you think that is, why for a minute you were a little bit hopeful and maybe ask yourself where you are now about where we are in this very difficult process that we're moving through in the country. I know I'm so mad that I actually got lured into feeling some hopefulness. I know better. Um, you know, when you, when you hear people who say slavery was a long time ago, why don't you get over it? Those are people who believe that uh, we have to take an originalist view of the Constitution, right? Those are people who, in things that they want to take glory in, they don't think that's too old at all. 
Um, and yet somehow this institution that was 250 years, right? So we had slavery longer than we have not had slavery. That was foundational. It's like, let's just ignore the fact that the man who drafted the declaration's occupation was he enslaved people. That was his job. That's how he made his money. Um, let's just set aside that the drafter of the Constitution was an enslaver, that the drafter of the Bill of Rights was an enslaver that 10 of our first 12 presidents were enslavers, that the majority of our Supreme Court were enslavers until 1865. Let's just set all that aside. Um, and let's talk about something else, <laughs> right? Right. So <laughs> you realize, right, that none of this is about truth. It's about the same people who say facts, not feelings, are, are actually only really worried about feelings and not really worried about the facts that we were founded as a slaveholding republic. That is what we, we were. Is that asking someone today to have um, guilt about what white people a long time ago did? No, but we have to acknowledge the truth of that and the way that that shapes then our, our society today. So, my answer to anyone, and I get it all the time, who says slavery was a long time ago, or my family never owned slaves. Your family didn't sign the declaration, but you claim that shit, right? So like, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> That's true. It's like, when it, when it comes to slavery, you want to date your family exactly. My family came in 1866. <laughs> But the Declaration, you, you claim all of this that preceded you when it glorifies you. Um, a, a great nation, if, if there is such a thing, has to accept all of it. So when we go to what happened in that brief reckoning of 2020, so of course, any of us who have studied race, whether you've studied it formally or you just are a human being in America with your eyes open, um, knew that this was going to be a brief reckoning. So what we all hoped was, Will we have enough force during that reckoning to make some transformative change before the inevitable backlash occurs and we do what we always do in this country, which is, as Ibram X. Kendi argues um, in the second to the last essay, Progress, is there's always progress happening in America. It's just usually not forward progress like we want to pretend, right? So that every time there's racial progress, it is met by racist progress. And we're clearly uh, in a moment of racist progress that is being aided and abetted by um, Dr. King's white moderates, right? The people who, um, they think, you know, maybe Ron DeSantis is going too far, but they kind of understand how we forced Ron DeSantis to do the things that he's doing, right? Like that's the argument is, well, if you guys hadn't asked for so many rights so fast, or you weren't tearing down monuments to enslavers, then he wouldn't have to, you know, be arresting black voters and uh, banning AP history. So we're, we're in that period, but it is a normal period. So when, when Dr. King, and I think he quotes, what, St. Augustine, the Ark of the Universe? The Birmingham, right? letter from the Birmingham. Um, when he says the Ark of the Universe is strong, but it bends towards justice, uh, I, I will never you know, dispute Dr. King, except to say I dispute that. Um, <laughs> because well. it doesn't, right? Because what that does is it, tell, it, it, it leaves us with the sense that no matter what's happening, we're always moving forward. And then we don't have to actually force it, right? If, if that arc bends towards justice, it's because we bend it. Right. But it's probably just a circle. That's what I think. It's a circle that's just going to come back on itself. And somehow, uh, here in the year of our Lord, 2023, black folks are just supposed to be grateful that it's not as bad as it used to be. And I just argue after 400 years, uh, the time for gratitude that I wasn't born in apartheid like my dad and that my dad wasn't born into slavery like his great grandmother, the time for gratitude for that is over. Yeah. So, so in, the, in the idea of an origin story and, and the, needy, the need to have a myth about who you are because yes. it makes you feel good, why, why do you think America has such a hard time dealing with the issue of race and talking about it in a constructive way that moves us forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I know you Do you thought, agree with that, by the way, oh, that we have a hard time talking about it? Of course. 
that's a rhetorical. Well, I just wanted to just I just wanted to lay the I didn't want to make any assumptions, but I mean, you have. Why do you think that is? Why is why is it so hard for people to kind of get into this and figure out how if we all could get together and go forward the right way, it would be better? Or you think some people just don't accept that? Like some people think that some folks ought to just move. I think a congresswoman just said that recently. That's not a new thing, by the way. You know, people have been talking about some other people ought to move, and now we ought to move. Or maybe we ought to have two separate countries. Like Lakeview ought to secede from New Orleans. Like there was a bill, there was I did, that wasn't a statement that they should. I'm sorry. There was a piece of legislation introduced in Louisiana some time ago that said you know a part of the city ought to move because we don't like what's going on. Yes. You know. So what? Why? Why do you think you've been doing this a long time now? You 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 go around the country. You give these talks. You feel people. Why is it so hard for us to just figure out a way to have this constructive discussion and move forward? I mean, that's a whole nother talk, but I'll, I'll try to do the speed round. Um, I mean, I think, one, we, we've all been indoctrinated into the same mythology of America, and we, we are not unique in the world in that we practice slavery. Uh, we are not unique in our hemisphere in that we practice chattel slavery. But what we are unique is that we were a country that practiced chattel slavery while being founded on ideas of liberty, right? And so there is something to me about that sort of hypocrisy being embedded in the very cornerstone of a country um, that has been corrosive to our ability to um, acknowledge the truth, to atone, and um, um, to repair and then to come together as a single society. You know, I get this question a lot. Uh, people want to talk about, you know, what Germany did, the, the denazifying that Germany did after uh, the Holocaust, and why have we not been able to do that? And there's a key difference. Germany wasn't founded on Nazism. Germany had hundreds of his years of history prior to that period of, um, of Nazi control. So you can purge all Nazis, symbols, names uh, from public life still have a glorious history. Now let's do that exercise with America. If you purge slavery and slave owners, what do you have? You can't talk about your first president, like let's go down the list, right? So because of that, because there's no way for us to separate the fact that a nation founded on ideas of liberty was also founded on the practice of slavery. Um, what we do then is we have to marginalize slavery. We have to treat it as an asterisk. We have to uh, downplay, we have to move on, and of course, marginalize the people who are the daily reminder of that crime. Um, so it makes it almost impossible for our nation to get over it because we so believe in our mythology and black people are so inconvenient to that narrative. How do you explain us? We're only here because that was a lie. That's literally the only reason black people exist is because of that lie. Um, so we, we cannot, to me, collectively, uh, psychically as a nation, get past that and struggle through that because it, it would force us to have to shift fundamentally the way we see our country. Like this idea of American exceptionalism, right? That we are just, it is in, in the air that we breathe. And then you have to deal with black people and slavery and realize that we actually were exceptionally uh, hypocritical is what we were. Um, that we were um, exceptionally cruel. That these great men, um, did unspeakable things to gain that power and to have the, the freedom and the leisure uh, to write these founding documents. So that, that is the struggle. And what it does is it makes us exceptional in ways that we should be ashamed. Um, when you compare us to the other Western democracies that also engaged in chattel slavery, but they didn't do it on their own land, right? They did it over here. That's my daughter. They did it over here. Um, and so when they end slavery, they, they didn't have this massive population of enslaved people that they had to deal with. So when you look at things like, we're the only one of the Western democracies that still has a death penalty. We know who are the primary victims of the death penalty. We're the only Western democracy that doesn't have universal health care. We have the most uh, income inequality, the highest rates of child poverty. Like, go down the list of what makes us exceptional. Um, and it's not the things that we want. So I just think um, 
a nation founded on a lie, and a lie that you, I mean, every nation is founded on lies and myths, but we broadcast our myth to the entire world. It, it is our core to our identity, is that we are the greatest, freest country the world has ever seen. But then how do you deal with black people and tell that story? Well, I wish we had like two hours, but we don't. And I want to leave a little time for you guys to answer, ask questions. So if anybody has any questions, why don't you come on up? We got about 15 minutes. And so if you keep, if, if you actually ask a question and not make a statement, that would be helpful. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, everybody? You must be from New okay. Orleans. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, thanks. That's you. Broadmoor talking right there, y'all. Quick question. <laughs> hey, um, one of my most um, endearing moments that I've seen in your public um, appearances or recordings is when you appeared on, um, uh, what's his name? He, uh, he had the Slaveocracy. Slaveocracy, he had the Slaveocracy podcast. Toure, you were on with Toure. Oh, uh-huh. And, you, and he asked you about education, about, where, about you sending your daughter to school. And you kind of warned him in that moment. And then he still asked you more about it. And you said that you were um, sending your daughter to a school that was a segregated school, high poverty school, so on and so forth, and not to a private school. And so my question is, is with all of these years that you've been covering education, what do you think we should be doing right now as far as trying to educate children? Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, thank you. I mean, what a fraught question in a city like New Orleans, right? Um, <laughs> that's a whole nother lecture, too. Um, <laughs> I well, mean, you might need just, to stay. Right. Be clear. That conversation, I, I'm a, um, an avid believer in public schools, traditional public schools, not privately funded um, public schools, but traditional public schools for a common good, despite the fact that I spent, you know, most of my career writing about how they don't serve black kids as well as they should or can. But I think that they are, la they are our last truly democratic institution and they, they matter. And frankly, most of our kids will be in them no matter what. Um, so what's happening, we all should be afraid of. If you don't think that the, the anti-CRT propaganda campaign is really about privatization, that's what it's about. It's about delegitimizing public schools. It's about privatizing this whole parental choice, parental rights, um, but isn't talking about the right of parents to be able to send their kids to a quality public education or public school. Um, so what we need to be doing is realizing that the opposition is extremely organized, extremely. I don't even think they reflect most Americans. In fact, the polling shows that they don't. But as someone who covers school board meetings for a long time, I know if five people show up to a meeting, they change policy. So we're sitting at home and we're tweeting or we're doing whatever we're doing and we're talking about those backwards folks who are going down and they are affecting policy that impacts all of our kids. So what can we do? Get off our asses and get organized and fight for our public schools and fight for our kids. Yes, ma'am. I have a longer answer, but I'm on a time constraint. <laughs> we got uh, my name Hi. is Mercy Quay from New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, you and I and Al Letson led a uh, virtual talk in 2020 at one time, and we ended that talk talking about the prioritization of black joy yeah. over the prioritization of black labor, which we have this history of. So my question to you, which is going to be a little bit different um, than I, most people might ask you, is where do you prioritize your own sense of black joy? Thank you for that question. You know, despite the fact that I write around about really, really horrific and terrible things, I am just a really happy person. <laughs> you know, I really am. Like I, one is probably because I'm agnostic, so I think if I don't enjoy my life now, this is all I got. So I better, <laughs> I better, I better get as much joy as I can. But the thing is, as hard as as studying uh, our history has been, our people have always had joy, love, like 
resistance, raised their babies, right? Created art, created music, had sex, drank bourbon, like all of those things. So, and I do all those things too. <laughs> so, you know, I, I do think it's a, an important question because um, sometimes I've been able to focus on it more than others. And certainly after the project came out and there was that, you know, all this high because people loved the project and it was selling out everywhere. And, um, and then it came and, and it hit right in the pandemic, right? Right, it's like when we were all stuck inside the like attacks and the attacks that became, they were legitimized by that small group of, of historians who tried to discredit the project. And that's all anybody needed was to say, oh, you know, Sean Wilentz at Princeton and he's a leftist. I, I wouldn't call him that, but whatever, um, right? Um, the attacks got really bad. And I was in my house with nothing better to do than be on Twitter, reading every single thing that every single person said, and I'm an Aries, and I don't come from shit, so I had time. I don't care if you had 10 followers or 10,000, I had time. Y'all know, know it's true, but I'm better now. <laughs> I'm better. I, I'm not spicy like that on Twitter like I used to be. Um, and those were moments where I was not, I was not prioritizing that. I was in a really low place and I had a very, very good friend of mine who's also a writer and he said something to me, he said two things to me that, that got me out of that and made me realize like, they're talking about you and your work because it means something. Yeah, amen. Right, if your work wasn't having impact, you don't see that type of power aligned against things that they don't think matter. And he said, one, you say you're doing this for your people, you're gonna kill yourself though. Like the way you're, you're being with yourself, the way you're working, the way you're depressed, the way you're drinking, you're gonna kill yourself. Um, and then you won't be here to do the work that you say you're doing for them. And the other thing he said was, nobody at this point can discredit your work but you. Now that was one where I was like, I gotta go and I hung up. <laughs> but then I sat there and I was like, He's right, and I had to call him back and be like, you're right, and so that changed everything, and now, like, I'm like, Fox News talks about me every two days, and I'm like, keep talking about me, keep selling my books, <laughs> right, keep keeping, keeping this project relevant, um, so I just think that question of joy is so important. I always get it from a black woman. Every time I speak, I get that question from a black woman because you understand that the toll, right? That we can have strong shoulders and still have a broke back at the same time, right? So thank you so much for that thank question. You. All right, you guys we have about five minutes left. I'll try to yes, be shorter in my right. answers. How you doing? Howdy. Your project focuses a lot on centering itself around the beginning and progress of slavery in the US. Uh, centering, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The, centering itself around the beginning and process of slavery in the U.S. Okay. as a lens to look at history. When did slavery end in the U.S.? Was it following the Civil War? Was it on Juneteenth? Was it following the end of debt peonage in the 1940s? Or was it some point later or at all? So I, I understand where the question is coming from. I think part of our problem is we have uh, such a paucity of language um, around describing uh, what it means to be unfree. So I think that there remains uh, many people who are in a state of unfreedom and a lot of black people specifically who are in a state in unfreedom. But I don't think you can study the institution of chattel slavery and think that we have anything remarkably related to that in the United States right now. Um, so slavery, of course, ended in stages. You had the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, which didn't end slavery, but so-called liberated the people in the jurisdiction that was no longer in the federal government. Um, but black people self-liberated, of course. Then you had um, the 13th Amendment, which codifies uh, the end of slavery, but of course, every, everybody watched, this is where everybody's always like, I watched Ava DuVernay the 13th. Yes, we all know about the asterisks. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, there are certainly people in our uh, carceral system who are in slavery, um, but it's not chattel slavery. Um, so I, I just feel though it would be a disservice to my ancestors who actually experienced chattel slavery to argue that we have slavery today in the United States. Um, but we do have 
lots of um, layers of unfreedom, for sure. Thank you. All right, the final two questions. Go ahead, sir. Um, if you listen to people like Ron DeSantis and his followers about what they claim your work seeks to do, predominantly it sounds like they're saying you're creating a narrative for Americans to hate America and mm -hmm. like the history. Tell um, me you haven't read the book. That's, yeah, that's what I always say I, because right? like, clearly. What is, what is a narrative you think that Americans, as we strive to actually form a more perfect union, can be proud of? Say the last part again. What is a narrative you think we as Americans can actually be proud of as we strive to form a more perfect union and like pieces of information like the 1619 Project inform us of the truth of our history? Well, one, if you, let's be clear, Ron DeSantis has not read the 1619 Project. Most of the people who um, want to uh, articulate what they think the 1619 Project is, it's clear you haven't read it because um, my opening essay on democracy is the most patriotic thing I've ever written. And um, not even intentionally, because I'm not a patriotic person, but <laughs> if you can't find hope in a people who are the only people in this country who were forced to come here, who were not meant to be citizens of this country, who were brought here to be laborers, who were not expected to survive the end of slavery. If you can't take hope in those people reading those founding words and saying, you didn't mean them for us, but we believe in them, we will fight to make them true for every American, what hope can you possibly have, right? That is what <laughs> the problem is. So, you know, I'm rereading um, Black Reconstruction, which is to me one of the greatest uh, historical and literary works ever produced in the United States. And of course, the entire argument of that is that black people saved democracy in the Civil War and have been the democratizing force in the United States through our struggle. So what you realize is when people say that this project, which is making that argument, right, that black people have been the greatest democratizing force and the greatest freedom fighters for all marginalized people in the history of this land, um, that they're saying that that makes you hate America, what you realize is that they only think that the heroes of the American story have to be white, and I don't think so. I think we are a multiracial country. We've been a multiracial country since 1619 when um, the white colonists purchased African people on the land that indigenous people already lived on, and that we have to have room for all of those narratives. If we want to be a great country, every person who played a role in it deserves to have their, um, their moment in the sun. Amen. Thank you. I might be paraphrasing here, but the, but the great James Baldwin, didn't he say, I criticize America precisely because I'll exactly. love us so much. I mean, it's so funny coming from people who, they criticize America all day, right? <laughs> And they believe that that's what makes them patriotic. That's what makes us patriotic, is to say we can be better than this. We don't have to be this ugly, stingy country that wants to target the most vulnerable children in America, that doesn't want to you know, feed people if they're poor, that doesn't want to house people if they're unhoused. Like, why is that the sign of a great country versus the version of America that people like myself believe in, which is that we have enough to take care of everybody in this country if we want to. <laughs> and that's well, what makes us great. Well, since we're in New Orleans, everybody ought to say true that. True that. True that. <laughs> All right, last question. All right. Yes, ma'am. This is for you. No, ma'am. Yeah, no, be it's for not her. a no, question. No, don't ask me. No, it's not a question. It's a correction. Oh. The last lynching in America was March 21st, 1981 yeah. in Mobile, Alabama. Thank you for that. Mike O'Donnell. He's not in the lynching museum. He's down really? the street in the Civil Rights Museum in Montgomery. His family still lives on that block. They are extremely poor. They live one block away from million dollar homes. There is a marker, still the tree stands where mm. he was hung from. Please bring that story to light. Can you message I'll me? I'll do that. All right. Message me. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I have, this is my, this is my last question because I know you got to go. You are, you, you are um, brilliant. Thank you. You write well. <laughs> you tell good stories. But you got to find your courage from somewhere because I know things get a little frayed sometimes. You, you talk a little bit about Ida B. Wells mm -hmm. and a couple of other folks. Where, where do you get your source of strength? 
when you're feeling beat down and it gets hard and the folks that, the folks that are your North Star, just historically or even your contemporaries who are actually doing incredible work, by the way, some of whom are here at this book festival as well. And then yeah, we'll roll out. I think that's a great, um, a great ending question because let me be clear, I, I don't feel like what I do takes courage. I really don't. Um, you can't study this history and think that, you know, a privileged writer at the New York Times, it's hard for me to do my job every day. Um, I study people who had to have real courage, who didn't have a major backing of an institution, who uh, didn't have any legal rights or protections in a society. If someone messes with me, I have a platform. I have, I have all of these things behind me. Um, so I, I don't feel courageous. I just feel that the work I do is in service of a great debt that I owe, I owe to um, my grandmother, Arlena Tillman, who had a fourth grade education and had every dream, hope, ambition that any other human being would have, but was born into a country she couldn't realize it, to um, our collective ancestors who fought for me to be able to be on a stage like this. So um, when people ask, you know, how do you do it? How do you keep going? Are you kidding me? Like, I, I read books. I write and I see something wrong in my society and I can try to vindicate uh, the people that that wrong is done to. So I don't take, I don't have courage, but I do take strength. I take strength in understanding uh, everything that was sacrificed for me to be where I am. And I don't have a choice but to do the work that I do. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cole Hannah-Jones, thank you so much. Thank you.